good to come back and uh, let's turn open our Bibles, especially those of you at home, uh, to Deuteronomy chapter 6. We left off from Deuteronomy chapter 5 last week and we shall wrap up this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 6 is a very familiar passage. If you are not familiar, then we all should be. Because in it contains some of the most important words, both uh, testified by Jesus as well. So let us get into the meat of things. I entitled this morning's message as, This is God. And the question I would like us to ask ourselves is, who is God to you? Uh, we talked about it last week a little bit. Uh, when, we saw, when we say the word God, it, it's just a word, right? G-O-D. Uh, some in capital, some not in capital. But the word God conjures different things to different people. And we live in a culture uh, where there are many gods that people believe in. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we are raised in our particular culture. Uh, in the Chinese culture, there are all kinds of gods. But when we come back together and we open our Bibles and we read the word God, it's like a generic term, right? It's, but what does it tell us? Who is this God? And that's the first question I like to, us to ask ourselves. The second question is, what do we do with the things that He tells us? Very fundamental, I guess, uh, from an English language viewpoint, very motherhood. It, it, you know, it's like the normal thing that we always ask ourselves, but I, I urge us to be very honest and very sincere in answering this as it applies to our lives. And, and I trust that through this morning that we can actually uh, learn something new and, and add on to our walk with God. The book of Deuteronomy is a time before the Israelites crossed the Jordan. And we all know that. It is here at a time when Moses is reminding the children of Israel. Now what we may not be aware is this. When they left Egypt approximately 40 years ago, before this time, there were two generations of people that came out of Egypt. They were the adults and there were at least 600,000 men. And then you have women and you have the elderly, but you have the second generation, which are the children. And these children grew up in the wilderness. Now the first generation and part of the second generation also died in the wilderness because they refused to enter into the promised land when the time came. But there is a third generation of Israelites whom Moses is addressing today. Not the first two, but the third. Who are the third? The ones who were born in the wilderness. And these were children that is now growing up and has become mature. And they are to be reminded. These are the ones who never saw the ten miracles. They never crossed the Red Sea with the previous generation. But that previous generation decided not to enter into the promised land. And, and, and you should read about that. In verse 1, it says, Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you. We, we talked about this last week, and I, I, I also mentioned to you that when I was growing up, I always thought commandments, statutes, judgments... They're just three English words for the same thing. But actually, they're not. And over the years, I've learned something which I think all of us should remember as well. The next time you read about commandment, statutes, and judgments, they are three very different things. But they overlap and they are related to each other. Let me give you an example. Uh, I, I remember we, we, we recently, or, or I think we still have the SPM exams. 
And the SPM exams were moved from last year to this year because of the pandemic. And so a commandment would be an instruction to tell us when the SPM exam is to take place. And so there is a commandment that in the month of March, from this date to this date, the SPM exam will be held. That's a commandment. It's not an option. It's not an opinion. It is a strict order that this will be the period of time. Now, statutes, on the other hand, would be this. Statutes would be some of the details that surround the SPM exam. Although it's held within this period, now, this date, there will be this exam, this date will be this exam, and these will be the things that will be covered in the exam, of which the teachers would have been teaching since Form 4 and Form 5. And that would be the statutes, the boundary of the exam. They will not examine you on things which you have never learned, and it won't be an STPM type of exam. And so that would be the statutes. It will not cross the borders of the definition of the exam. The third part would be judgment. Now, judgment, as you know, many of us, all of us will have to make judgments every day. Uh, when we leave later and you go to uh, the coffee shop or wherever you go for lunch, you make judgments. Should I have chakwe or should I have chicken rice? Should I have this or that? And these are decisions to be made. And each decision has its corresponding results or corresponding um, reaction. If you eat something which is not right with you, well, you can get indigestion or you can get different problems. So judgments in an SPM exam would be, you have to pass the SPM exam, so you must do well, and so that you can get on to, say, SCPM or, or, or uh, finish with a certificate. If you fail, something will happen. That's a judgment. And so you must make decisions on your exam. Uh, some are multiple choices. Some are uh, essay-type questions. And as you write, you make decisions. I remember I made some bad decisions when I was doing my Form 5. And as a result... Um, I, I failed. I failed my Form 5. And that's a, a, a story for another day. Uh, something which many people may not realize. And I failed my Malay of all papers. Right? And, and that's so important because the judgment is if you fail your Malay, you fail the entire exam. And hence, I failed my entire exam. And then when I look back and I took the July paper and I passed it with credits, what happened? made some wrong choices in the karangan, in the essay. And, and there is no turning back because each decision you make during the exam is very material. And hence, long story short, uh, something that was bad for me in my life uh, eventually turned out to be quite good. Uh, but that is left for another day. And that's judgments. And so we are all faced with that because God gives us the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments. And the judgments are for us now to decide, am I going to follow making wrong decisions? If I follow making wrong decisions, God will punish. If I follow making good decisions, then like the Israelites, they can live in the land and prolong their days I could actually enjoy my life before God and God will be blessing me. You know, these are decisions, actions that we have to make. And God says this, that He has commanded Moses to teach you. Now, the Hebrew word teach is a, in, in this case is a very interesting word. The, the technical word uh, for, for learn to learn is lamad. But here, it is just a, an inflection of the sound, and it's lamed, and it's to teach. And so, it gives us a picture that if you don't learn, you can't teach. And so, all of you who aspire to be teachers, you must first learn before you can teach. And that's how the Hebrew people look at this. It's the same alphabets, or so the same consonants, 
but with a slight difference in sound, it turns meaning from learn to teach, from lamad to lamed. And the ancient way of teaching is very similar to the ancient Chinese way. They, they teach an ox with a, a, a rod, and so they, they poke the, 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 the ox so that they learn to walk straight, and after a while, the ox will learn to walk straight in plowing the field. Now, in the ancient Chinese way, uh, we have this concept called the rotan, which I think in modern day, this concept of rotan has kind of disappeared. Uh, I mentioned to you that my dad is a very conservative and traditional Chinese, and not only he has rotan, he has rotans, uh, so that there are backups in case one breaks in the event of use, there is always a spare. And, and people learn that way, isn't it? Many of us, I, I notice, uh, we, we grew up in that era. But in the modern era, well, we don't see that anymore. And so, you don't find people selling it because nobody buys them. Uh, we have a Western way of teaching children, and we let them make all the mistakes, and you scold them, and, and, and hope that they will grow out of it. But in the Hebrew way, which is very similar to the Chinese way, to learn is to use the cane. And then when they learn, they will teach their children. And so, to, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess. Because when you cross over to inherit the land that God is giving them, God has rules. So learn this. God is essentially telling them, my land, my rules. So when you go in and inherit this land that I've promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there are rules, the commandments, the statutes, and the judgment. So that when you go in, you do what I tell you, and then they'll be great. That you may fear the Lord your God. And what do you mean by fear the Lord? Literally, the word fear means to be afraid. I know in modern day, we, we don't like the word be afraid. Why should we be afraid of God? Why should we be afraid of anyone? And hence, our children grow up not afraid of the parents, not afraid of authority. Why? Because they've never seen a cane in their lives. So nobody has ever been punished to, to learn by experience. But God has shown them from Egypt into the wilderness and all the things that they have encountered God is a consuming fire. When you go against God and worship the golden calf, people died. And hence, that they may be afraid of the Lord, not in the sense of trembling every day, but knowing that if they do something wrong, the rotan is there, the divine rotan is there, to help them make good decisions. I do remember there was once, uh, because of my dad being a, a conservative and, um, and with easy access to rotan, there was one day I was in kindergarten, I still remember this, and the kindergarten is not too far away from my house. Um, and one day, uh, my grandmother would come and pick me up every day, but she was late, and I panicked. And so as all, well, I, I suppose as all, I, I assume that it's all, I walked home, <laughs> and I was only, what, six at that time. And, and I, I walked home, and, and my grandmother couldn't find me. She came home and then found me at home. Now, when my dad came home, uh, he wasn't pleased. Why? Because as a six-year-old, you're not supposed to walk all over the place, cross the main road, and then come home. If, if that would be the case, then my grandmother wouldn't have to go and fetch me. Well, the next thing that we all know that would happen is the cane came. And that made me remember that the next time my grandmother doesn't come, I don't walk home. And I never did ever since. So the cane does work. When there is a fear of my father caning me again, I decided that I would not do anything that he doesn't tell me to do. And in this case, when they say you may fear the Lord your God, you've seen God in the wilderness, don't make the same mistakes so that you may be happy with God. And that's what it is, that you may 
keep all his statutes and his commandments, and then your son and your grandson. Well, let me first explain. It, there is no grandson word in Hebrew. The, the relationships in Hebrew is very straightforward, like Chinese. There's the father, there's the mother, there's a son, there's a daughter, right? Uh, there is a brother and there's a sister. And then every other relationship is a combination of this. So this word grandson means what? The son of your son. Well, it works. And so we know whose son are we talking about. And in this case, the son of your son, your grandson, and that all the days of your life as you live in this promised land, you will live long. You can continue to enjoy the land. And so the principle is, if we obey God's commandments, we will live in peace with God, and that would be good. Verse 3, Therefore, Actually, the word therefore is added in by the translators. Uh, but it, it's, it's a good word. It says here, and, and I, I mentioned this to you all the time. This word here appears in the Bible some 5,000 times. And that should tell you that this word here is very important. But it's translated in many English words, and, and, and that's why you don't see it. But the word here in its basic form is not just to to hear the sound, but you're supposed to understand what you hear, which is perception. You understand it, and then God expects you to do something about it. And so when the commandment comes from the government that this period is going to be an SPM exam, do you think there is a choice? No. Commandments have no choice. So when we understand these commandments, God is not expressing an opinion. God is expressing what He wants us to do. And when He does that for us, it is not left for you and I to say, hmm, let's see whether I'm free to do this. If I like it, I would do something about it. That's not how commandments go. You realize that when many of you are parents, when you tell your children to do something, I'm sure you're not leaving them an option, right? Make your bed. So you don't have a bracket when you feel like it, you do. You don't feel like it, that's okay, it's cool. That's not how you give commandments. That's not how God gives commandments. So here means to listen properly, understand it, and then God expects us to do something about it. And so it tells the Israelites, Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful, guard yourself, to observe it, to do it. And so it's not something that you can think about it and then you keep playing your PS4 games. It is to listen and your mother says, Go and make up your bed. You go and make up your bed. Unfortunately, today, go and make up your bed sounds like, well, when you finish your game and you have eaten whatever chocolates you like, and if you feel like it, maybe you make your way to your bedroom, and while you make your way to the bedroom, you might be distracted by something else and you never make your bed. That's not what it means here. God says that you may be careful, make sure you listen properly, Guard it, keep it, make sure that you don't forget the exact words your parents are telling you, and then you do it. I, I guess we, we're all aware of the, uh, the Nike slogan, right? I love the Nike slogan. Just do it. When you hear your parents tell you to do something, just do it. Don't question it. Why? Because your parents have greater wisdom than you do. And when you grow up to be your own parents, then I trust that you should have your wisdom because you've learned that from your parents. And that's how God wants them to do. When they learn, do it, they teach it to the next generation so that the next generation will keep and do it and then they teach it to the next generation and so your son and the sons of your sons and by definition, it keeps going down the line. Otherwise, there will be one generation where they all forget. And if they forget, we won't be here. All right? And then that you may multiply greatly as the Lord your God of your fathers have promised you. The word is davar, and we will look at the word davar later on in the chapter. But davar is a very interesting word. It just means word in the English. But in the Hebrew, it is a word, it is a matter, it's an issue, it's a promise. It's something that you need to pay attention to because God is speaking. 
So when God is speaking, He is not moving His lips. In, imagine this, right? Moving your lips, but nothing comes out. You can't hear anything. Now, many children hear their parents this way. They see the parents' mouth move, but no sound comes out. So they don't hear, make up your bed. Now, in this case, when he says, when your God has promised your fathers, promise who? So it needs to take us back all the way to Genesis, right? Chapter 12, 13, 14, 15, where God has promised Abraham to make him the father of many nations, but there is a promised land. That, he will, that God will show him and that in 400 years later, they will come back. And that is that 400 years. 400 years ago, God promised Abraham. That's the word, davar, the word that God gave to Abraham. Now, in the English, we do use this. I give you my word. I'm sure those younger ones, you'll be singing it in many love songs, right? The word I give you. And it's a promise because your word should be gold. Right? The ancient Chinese have this, let, let your word be valuable. Don't, don't simply use words. And so that when you say, yes, I'll do for you, do it. And God said that to Abraham and then to Isaac and then to Jacob. And now 400 years later, they are here beside the Jordan River. And so Moses is telling them, you know, this is what God has promised. What does this tell us? That God is a faithful God. Now, he may not do it the next day. And he told Abraham, 400 years. And that's where we are now. That you will enter into a land that is flowing with milk and honey. In the Chinese, we read, Lao Nai Zi Man. Right? Milk and honey. But think of it this way. When you walk into Israel... I don't see milk flowing on the streams. And I don't see honey dripping from the trees. The sad part is when I go to Israel, I see trees that is half dead or mostly dead because the times I go are times where there's no water. And, and, and it's towards the end of the year, after the summer, there's nothing green. Everything is brown. The green grass, when we talk about green pastures, is just little pieces of grass that grows behind a rock because it's shielded from the sun. But then I've been told, if you go in the springtime, like now, it will be green, the flowers will be out. And what does that tell us is this. First of all, flowing means easily accessible. Lots of it with milk. Why does God talk about milk? Unfortunately, in our English word milk, for those of us who are older, milk equates to osteoporosis. Right? So drink more milk because it's got calcium. But in the Hebrew, and very much like ancient Chinese, milk is the best part of the animal. It is the greatest part for the Babies, it is called the fat of the animal. And it comes out, it's produced. Now, of course, today we don't care about fat, so you have low fat, no fat. So milk is just white-colored water. But in the days of Israel, milk is the fat of the animal that they can enjoy. What is fat? In the Hebrew context, fat means the best part, the choicest part. And, and that is what God is giving them, the best part of life that is freely flowing, which means that when the animals go in, there'll be enough grass to eat and they'll be producing milk more than any other cows or goats or sheep. It's freely flowing. If you're not aware, today the technology in Israel produces the highest per capita cow in the world. Literally flowing with milk. But honey, honey. Well, if you read the book of 1 Samuel, when David was running away from, from his life because of King Saul chasing him, he came across a cave and there was a tree and there was honey dripping down. Well, I've never seen honey dripping down like that, but... It was there during the time of David. It is thick, 
substance that is coming out from the beehives. And what do beehive bees need to make honey? Flowers. Now, I have personally never seen lots of flowers, but I was told in springtime, flowers galore everywhere. And that's where bees make their honey. But there are other kinds of honey, by the way, from dates. From dates. And there are lots of dates in Israel. And they are so fresh and fertile that it would seep out. And so that's honey. What, what does this phrase mean? This phrase means God is faithful, is going to honour His word to I, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and will give them the best of life in Israel. I remember telling you this, in all my travels to Egypt, Israel and Jordan, Israel is the best real estate in that area. The best in the sense that it's got lots of rivers, lots of fresh land for planting and it's not hilly like Jordan. Jordan is like 1,000 meters up, then bang, zero at ground level. So how are you going to plant on the, on the rocks? Rocky slopes, you can't. But in Israel, there are slopes, there are rivers, there's lots of rain. And when does rain come? Rain only comes five months in a year. And God says, if you obey me and you keep my commandments, I will give you the rain. And you will have more than enough. And the days that you find that you have no rain, do you know what they're supposed to do? Check back on themselves. Are they careful to observe the words of God? And so God brought them in there, not only that it's the best real estate, but it is an environment where they have to trust God, else God will stop the rain. And then no more water in the ground, no more vegetation, and they will die of hunger. And what do you do when you die of hunger? You move and you will not enjoy the land. And so God says, you want to enjoy the land, obey Him. Now we come to our next and greatest commandment. Now I didn't say that it was the greatest commandment, but I am suggesting to you that this is the most important commandment in the entire Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5 is commonly called the Shema by the Jews. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. It's a very easy two verses to remember, but for the most part, we, we actually couldn't be bothered with it. You know why? Because it's in the Old Testament. So we really don't care about the Old Testament very much, isn't it? Be honest. When you come to the four Gospels, in Mark chapter 12, there was a scribe that came to Jesus and, and, and asked Jesus in verse 28, which is the first commandment of all? By the way, the word first in the Greek is first in rank as well. So what is the most important? So I guess, you know scribes, right? In, in the Hebrew culture, the scribes are the ones who knows the Tanakh, the Old Testament, that we, well, we call the Old Testament very well because they are the ones who write. And when they write, they make sure that every word is correct. And they have that tradition. And so they know. And so they ask Jesus, so which is the first commandment, the most important commandment of all? And verse 29, Jesus answered him and said, the first or the most important of all the commandments is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one which we just read. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And this is the most important commandment. Now the second is similar to it. It says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, which is in the book of Leviticus. There is no other commandment greater than these. Do you, does it surprise you? Why didn't Jesus invent some new commandments? Why? Because he is a Jew. 
if he is a Jew, he knows his commandments, right? And this is in the same passage which we are dealing with today, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Is this a one-off? Matthew 22, the lawyer, lawyer doesn't mean our lawyer today, right? Uh, they, he, they didn't do an LLB and went for bar. This lawyer means a man who is familiar with the law of Moses, right? The Torah. Came to test Jesus, says, Teacher or Rabbi, which is the great commandment? I would say the word great would be an, a superlative, the greatest commandment in the Torah. So, is the Torah important? Well, let's see what Jesus says. In verse 37, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first, or most important and greatest commandment. Verse 39, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And observe verse 40. On these two commandments hang all the law, the Torah, and the prophets, the Nevi'im. You see, the, the Jewish people don't have our sequence of Old Testament. The Tanakh comprises of three segments. The, the Torah, the Navi'im, and the Ketuvim. So the, the law of Moses, the, the prophets, and the writings. And so here, the law and the prophets means everything in that Old Testament, well, it hangs on these two verses. What, what does that mean when Jesus said that? It means that, please, remember these two verses. It's the most important. Well, if that's not enough, book of Luke. And Jesus said to this lawyer, what is written in the Torah? What is your reading? What's your opinion, young man? And so the young man answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he, Jesus, said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. Now, obviously, when we read the Gospels, many a times we just read and, and skim the surface. But I want to highlight to you that this is important. Jesus is saying, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, are the most important instructions. And yet, do we know that? And do we care? That's the question. Well, Jesus reminded the people then. Uh, we are talking about the same verses today. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means, hear, listen. Israel, Jehovah, your God, Jehovah is one. That's all. And, and in the Jewish world today, uh, I, I'm not suggesting we all become Jews, so don't get me wrong. I'm just sharing with you their practices. When they say this is the most important Torah, what do they mean? They mean this when they are young, they are taught this, and so that when they wake up, they will recite this verse. When they go to sleep, they will recite this verse. They will keep reminding themselves that the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That is what they remind themselves. Now, one of the problems of that I recall in my own life is this. I was taught to say a prayer every night. But you know when you keep saying the same thing over and over again over the years, it, it just is this sounds, right? You, you just memorize it and it has no more meaning after a, a while. And so I, I prayed the same prayer for 15 years. I can still remember this. I teach the children, but I never think twice about what it means. And so that's one problem of making this into a ritual. That if you keep repeating it, it means nothing after a while. So listen to this. Say, hear Israel, Shema Israel. That's where the, 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 the title of this, this uh, law is. It's called the Shema. To hear. Tell them to listen, understand, and do something about it. 
that the Lord our God, the Lord is Echad, is one. And so that will bring them back to Exodus chapter 20 when you remember the Ten Commandments that you shall have no other gods before me. Don't make any images of the animals in the sky, on land and in the sea. That the Lord your God is a jealous God. And so it is to remind them that is one. Don't have a Baal here and a, 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 a Asherah there and a golden calf here. None. Only one focus. The Lord your God. That, that's basically to tell them that when you put on your glasses in the morning, look at God. When you sleep, pray to God. That there is peace throughout the night that you will wake up the next morning. And when you wake up the next morning, you thank God you have a chance again to breathe. Then it says, you shall love. And the word love is achav. Now, this is not Greek agape. So please put all of these Greek words aside. It is not our modern day love song. None of that. So the word achav means to give. That, that's all it means. It's a very simple term. Does it have an expression of uh, an emotion? Yes, obviously, right? But the Hebrew words are not particularly interested in abstract words. They are interested in concrete terms. What can you do when you say you have? You give. When a boy says, I love you, what do you think the girl would say? Show me. Isn't it? You, you keep saying, I love you, I love you. And nothing happens. You know, the Chinese is very practical. Is it? Talk is cheap. Show me if you say you love me, isn't it? And the Hebrew is the same. Ahav means you give. You give yourself to God. How? With all your heart. Now, heart is this, do, 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 right? this little organ here. But how? that's abstract, isn't it? I mean, how do you give this heart? Actually, the heart in Hebrew refers to the mind, the source where you make decisions, so that all your decisions you make in your life, you account it to God. And that's what it means to love God. You cannot say, well, my life, my choice, my decision, but when I come on Sunday, okay, God is your choice. God says, no, your life, you give to God with all your heart. And then with all your soul, the word soul is nefesh. We don't have this word. This soul is very nebulous. We think of Casper the ghost floating around. It's not that. The nefesh is the part of us inside us that's living that you can't see. But you know it's alive. And so God says with your entire being, you cannot love God. We say, oh, I, let me just give you one finger. But the rest of the nine is for myself to do my thing. Well, either you give God your entire self or you don't give God your entire self. You can't give God a part of you. That's not love. Can you imagine a boy says, I love you, and then, but I only love you on Monday from 2 to 5. What do you think the girl will say? Please go to hell, isn't it? That, that, those words will come out. Why? Because you can't love a person and say you love a person for a fixed period of time. Either you love in whole or you don't love at all. And the last one is with all your strength. The word strength is actually an adjective word with very, and we don't have this English word, right? How do you love God with very? When God looked at the world He made on day six, it was very good. It was tov me'od. And this word here, strength, is me'od. So, with all your very, well, the word very gives us an expression and an imagery of everything you have. What is everything you have? Your entire being and your, all your strength that you have and all your abundance that you have. What do you mean? Everything you own. Otherwise, how are you going to love God? Is it, oh God, I love you, but my money, my money. That, that's not the picture here. So if we are told to love God, everything belongs to God, and I assure you, all of us know that very well. 
It's just a matter of practice, right? It's a matter of practice. Moving forward, verse 6, and these words, davar again, these are the words which I command you today because these words are not just letters with sounds, right? These words would mean all the commandments, the promises, and all the commandments, statutes, and judgments. Keep it in your heart, in your mind, so that when you talk to people, when you look at things, you can have a basis of living. You shall teach. Now, this word teach is not the earlier word teach. And this is to show us this. The English translation really is designed for reading. So you think that the Bible is actually originally in English. So when you read the word teach in verse 1, and now teach in verse 6, so when you check the Oxford Dictionary, teach is teach. But in this case, when the translators chose the word teach, the Hebrew word means to repeat. Now, to repeat means, you can just imagine, a little kid at the feet of the grandfather or grandmother talking about the good old days. And what do you think the grandfather and grandmother will do? He will tell you the same story every day if you sit down there, isn't it? And after a while, you too can repeat that story. And that's what it means to repeat. Repeat all these to them diligently to your sons and speak to them when you sit down when you walk in your journey, and when you lie down to sleep, and when you rise up. You see, all these are verbs. So what does that mean? It means when you sit down for dinner, you talk about it. When you sit down to chit-chat, you talk about it. When you walk out to go jalan-jalan, you talk about it. When you lie down to sleep, you whisper about it. When you wake up, you remind them about it. What does that mean? It means that keep it in the front of your mind all the time. And you know what's the, the secret here? When you do that, you will never forget God. Unfortunately, in our 21st century, this is not possible. We're very busy with many, many things in life, and we are only very free when we make ourselves free on Sunday, say 9.30 onwards for about two hours, and, and then our life catches up with us again. And so God tells them, I know your life is going to be busy too. When you wake up, you've got to get your ox and start plowing and do all these things. And when you come back, you're dead tired. And God says, when you rise up, when you lie down, when you walk in the house, outside the house, do that. And our last verse is, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be frontlets between your eyes and you'll write down on the doorposts of your house and your gates. Now, all these seem to be like, wow, you know, so many symbolic things. The Jews look at it very literally. So when, they, when God says, write them between the frontlets of your eyes. So there is this teflim, a little box. And in the box, they have the Torah written. And then they tie it at the top of the head, in between the eyes. So they have actually measurements. So the Jews are very particular about this. Don't get me wrong. I'm not here to suggest that all of us come with boxes tomorrow. right? But this is what they mean. So that when they walk and they remember, and then they tie it on their hands. And then at the doorpost, there is this little box there uh, that's called the mezuzah. But the mezuzah is also the doorpost. It's a word for the doorpost. So you stick it to the doorpost. And in that doorpost, it's actually a little box. And in there, they write the Torah. And so when they walk out the door, they walk back in, they see that and they remember what's inside. Now, when I was there in, in Israel, I took this picture of this little boy. Um, it is his coming of age ceremony at the Western Wall. And you look at him, I have two arrows there. And you can see he, he does the same. And that little big thing that he's carrying, really heavy, is called a Torah scroll. The entire Torah is written there. And poor boy, he, he, very hard to, to carry. But they actually do that all the time. So now let me end by asking ourselves the first two questions of this morning. 
Who is God to the Israelites? The religious Jews would do it exactly. So, you know when you do things exactly, after a while you forget why you're doing it because it becomes very cultural. Just like how I made that prayer for 15 years and after a while, it just comes out of my lips but I really don't think much about it. What is God's word to you? And so to them, it is ritual. I'm not saying whether it's good or bad. I'm not suggesting we follow the Jews. But I think it is important for us to remind ourselves to find our own way to remember God every day. To remember His words all the time. Now, I know some of us may have wallpapers with Bible verses. Right? That's good. Uh, we, we, we actually look at our electronic Bibles all the time. That's good. And I urge you all to keep doing that so that we are duly reminded that our lives are walking before God and not just for the sake of ourselves. That when we love the Lord our God, we mean something about it. So we don't sing, I love you, Lord, and actually it's just a nice beat, nice music, nice drums, and then we forget about it. So when we say we love God, we mean it. When we make choices in life, there is the Word of God to guide us in our judgments. When we live every day, we remember His commands that we do it. It's not an option. And thereby we know the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That we don't look at idols, we don't look at money, we don't look at people who tell us. We look at God because He is our boss. And that was how... how I, I had chosen to, to live. Lots of temptations in life, isn't it? But if you know that your boss is God, then many temptations are no longer temptations because we already have judgments made in our minds, whether we will or will not do it. And that will be how we'll be guided on a daily basis. When we make a mistake, and I'm sure there are days that we are weak where we make mistakes, God knows. And so we repent and we come back and we ask for forgiveness. But nevertheless, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We love Him with everything we've got and thereby that should be our theme of life. We are duly reminded in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke. And why are we not paying attention to it when it's the most important? And I trust that from, from here on, we learn something and that will make God's Word important in our lives in everything we think and we do. And may God bless all of us. <laughs>